Hello, everybody. Welcome to Oregon State University's Permaculture Design Course Pro. This is the summer fall 2023 class. We're October 2nd. We're into our sixth office hour. We're into the latter half of the class. So we're moving more into design. We're moving into water, a little bit more of local vegetation at say, and we're starting to get into some design conversations. So super fun to get into those and start chatting about them. Nice to see everybody here today. So what I want to do today is we've got one question thus far, and then looks like Janet's just typing away. So might get another one. And then with the rest of the time, I'd like to jump into some examples and take a little bit about the upcoming assignments. Cool. So question number one. They go back to it yet again from Samantha. So this question is, I wanted to ask more about Creator Gardens. Building one seems like it could be a great solution to the drainage problems on my site, but I've had some problems finding good resources about building them. I've also come across a few examples online which give me a good general idea, but I'd love to have some more specific information. Mainly, I'm wondering if there are recommendations or proportions for a Creator Garden. How deep does something like this need to be effective? Great question. So... To think about a creative garden, we have to think that this is a semi-dry pond. So sections of it are wet year-round and sections of it uh, fill up and drain and fill up and drain and fill up and drain. So generally what we're doing is we're terracing up and we're terracing in such a way that we're respecting what's called the angle of repose. So the angle of repose is the angle in which the material that you're working with will self-arrest. Clay has a more acute angle of repose. Sand has a much more... Uh, shallow angle of repose. So that uh, that's all dependent on your soil and what your soil can hold and stabilize. And usually what we'll do is we'll do a test during. So once we take our first shovel full, we kind of put it off to the side and we let it settle and we get a sense of what's the angle it's holding. So if it's holding a one to two angle, we know that the rise will be one and the run will be two. So if it's a one to three or a one to four, we'll get that sense. And that really determines how deep we can be. Because if that angle is more acute, you can be deeper in a narrower area. But if that angle is more shallow, you would have to have a larger area to go deep. So it's really about what that looks like right off the bat. So I'm going to show you some examples. I'm just going to make sure that I've got all the client information put away. Uh, Amarins, is it sound or can you hear me? I can hear him. Yeah. Sorry about that, Amarins. Um, I'm just going to type in here. Hi, Amarins. Please check your audio settings. And if it doesn't work, and they've already logged out. So let's talk a little bit about creative gardens and show some examples. So these were examples that Sepp Holzer uh, presented when I was there back in, oof, that was a while ago. I think it's about 10 years. Um, I'm going to share my screen. New share. Sharing. Desktop team. Cool. Can everyone see that now? Yeah, cool. All right. So Generally, when we're looking at creator gardens, this is a great example here. We'll um, zoom in. Oh, I think I have to, oh, there we go. Yeah. So generally, again, A equals B in terms of our bag and borrow pits. So we have areas that we're, we're drawing from and then how we're moving to. So this area here, this amount of material. Oh, my mouse, my mouse drawing is on, on point today becomes this material. And the way that we would design this or figure this out is by doing a cross section, like we've seen here, and so that gives us sense. Or we could use a 3D model if we want to use something like Google SketchUp. Um, I'm gonna clear that. And then I'm gonna zoom out again. And then moving over. And then once we finish that first dig, this is kind of the look that we get. So we have some areas that are definitely gonna be pond. These are the two posts for the deck, for the dock that goes out into the water. Uh, we've seen that before. This is a great example of how embedding of materials can be super useful 
in a crater garden. Um, one of the things we do in temperate climates is we'll be we'll embed rock into the terraces. I'll do this as well, just for terraces, because you'll find that that rock will absorb heat in the early spring. It'll melt there first, and you'll start to get growth around that area, which is really quite beautiful. This also, this area in the bottom here, I don't think these are the same, but this area on the bottom here has what's called a dry creek bed. So if this um, crater garden is being fed by some other water source, be it roof or runoff or whatnot, then it has a rock armored rundown so that when the water comes down here, it doesn't scour out and remove the material uh, and then start to, um, start to channelize. Again, the plantings can be quite dense. So the perennial nature of these plantings can be very dense. This is uh, close to being a good example of the clumpings of threes and fives. There's actually a great course coming up with uh, Jamie, who's an instructor here in the class, and we're going to talk about aesthetic design. So this is one of those places where this uh, yellow flower, I would have added a third one. You get more of sort of a wabi-sabi design if you, if you extend it out. And then usually what we'll do is we'll put our talls behind creates more of a focal feature in terms of aesthetic design. And then, so we've seen these before, those are the ones we saw. This is a great example. I'm actually going to make this full screen. This is a great example of this beginning area. So this is that northern side, pardon me, southern side. So this is this side of the, the area of the house. So this photo is kind of up here looking this way. And this is a great example of how you can work in a very tight space to create water capture. You can see that the pond on the south side here, or, or pardon me, north side here is already done. And this creates walkway into the area. And then again, terraces down into a pond area. This is a, a removal zone. So one of the last things this uh, excavator will do is we'll build up this last section and then come out. Uh, but this is great. So we've got hoogles at the top. Uh, we've got berms on the bottom, and then we have a terrace structure that comes down. Again, the size of that terrace is, is based on the angle of repose. So what I would do is if you're designing one, dig a test hole, see the angle of repose. Even a small, like <clears throat> the great thing about angles and percentages is they scale. So if you make a small pile with dirt uh, with a shovel, it's the same as doing it with a big shovel on the end of an excavator. You can get a sense of that, and then you can run your calculations going off of that. And then... This was a much bigger one that was designed, I believe this one was in Portugal. Osterich, no, 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 this is still in Austria. Um, but the detail in this one is exceptional. So just where the water retention zone is, where the planting zones are, how this works. You'll find that um, in this design, this is uh, corkscrewed, corkscrew terraces. So instead of a full terrace and then another, there's actually a full corkscrew. So it's a full walkway. It's almost like an inverted screw, if you will. So that walkway, if you follow it along here, I'll, I'll draw it. So if we're walking along, it's like those maps we used to get in grade four puzzles. So it corkscrews down. So those terraces are not all the same level the terrace that slowly drops as you come down and then into that water as well. Uh, in areas like this, and you'll see this here, you'll usually put little pathways to get up the terraces every once in a while. Because uh, one of the things that people will do, I had to talk a client out of it last week. Um, they just wanted a big terrace that they weren't able to walk up and down. And then this you can see as well, you usually want a section where you can walk up or have a, a smooth area. So this is where you'll start to see that smoothness. I'm working on design in uh, the Olympic Peninsula and we're doing exactly this. We're basically smoothing out the terraces on the inside of the fence so that way you can walk up and down and access all the areas. The terraces are massive. They're like 10 feet of difference, uh, but they're, they're useful. So yeah, generally that's what I would do. I would understand the angle of repose and then using either um, a digital program or a piece of graph paper, pick a scale so everything fits on there. And then I would use that angle of repose, three to one, four to one, two and a half to one, but take your measurements and bring it down to, um, bring it down to a ratio. And then I would basically design out what those angles would be. And then uh, usually once you're getting into the lower section, so sub six feet, five feet, you'll wanna do a little retention zone, but you can do it more shallow as well. Um, and then just remember that the material you bring out of the pit has to go somewhere. So normally when you design it, you design it in such a way that that crossover area, so if it's six feet and six feet, it's 12, 
you're being conscientious that that other area will create burned. And you then want to go back to your sector analysis and go, where's the wind coming from? Where's that negative wind, that winter wind? The summer winds can desiccate, but you know, winter first and then summer winds, and then place them in such a way. Remember that the height of any windbreak, be it solid like an earthwork or be it permeable like a, a, a tree break, is going to be 10 to 20x horizontally effective of the height. So if the height is 10 feet tall, it'll be 100 to 200 feet effective. So that wind will hit it pop over and come back down. The thing we want to avoid is having that wind come back down, especially if it's permanent, like a berm, inside that radius and have plantings. Because what will happen is that wind will hit and you'll see destruction. Um, it happens a lot in clear cuts. So if you ever get a chance to uh, walk a clear cut in the forest, you'll see that the wind can pick up speed as it gets to an area. And if you then walk in land 10 to 20 X, the height of whatever the trees are in, in the direction that the wind is coming, you'll actually see damage within the forest as you're going up. So yeah, great question, Sam. Any any other follow-ups for those? Um, so you know, you mentioned finding the angle of repose in my soil. One thing I did notice when I was um digging my test holes in that area of my yard is um the soil has a decent clay content on the top, but when you get about 16 17 inches down there's a layer that's like almost all sand and so clearly as i'm digging down it's going to change quite a bit um so what i just want to dig a nice deep hole and kind of get a sense of what kind of layers i have and yeah then change the angle as i 100 percent. all right so usually what i'll do and sep does this in miniature he actually builds models so he takes all the material he sizes it to the centimeter because he's he works in metric and he sizes and he builds an entire model um, in miniature and then he fills it with water to see if it'll hold. It's it's fascinating that a man has been doing this for as long as he has still makes models. So absolutely, you can do it one of two ways: you can build a model to scale, or you can then take a profile cut and use that profile cut on your mapping software or on your piece of paper and basically say, this is the band that's sand, this is the band that's clay. And then if you're coming into an area like at the bottom where you where you want a pond, you may then need to borrow the material that's coming off of that first 16 inches. And that's gonna be the layer, the layer that you're gonna to use to line that bottom. If it's more porous. Great questions, awesome. Any other follow-up questions from anybody else on this? about Creta Gardens. Okay, sounds good. Uh, let's go back to desktop one and all this hours. Cool. All right. Amarins, can you hear us? I know I saw you came back. Just let me know if we're good. And then I've left the examples there for you to, to check out there, Sam. I know there's uh, Janet, in module six, uh, soil improvement methods, it was mentioned that managing grazing, if done right, can help regenerate soils. Could you just a little bit about what done right looks like as far as stock density per land per grazing time? For example, how many horses or cattle on a given portion of land and should we allow the grass to be grazed to 50% of stem height? What are the ground rules for good grazing practices? We have our lower pasture divided into several pastures, but I still feel we are overgrazing. Yeah. Okay. So uh, the number of holistic management courses I've taken uh, have all given different numbers for um, stock days. And that's generally what you're, you're dividing down to. You're dividing to for these animals and their appetite and the growth per the field. What is the stock days? How many days can this herd specifically be on this area? Um, and Joel Salton puts it best. It's basically once, <laughs> once that grass is raised down to boot height. So basically five to six inches, that's when you want to move the animals. And generally, if it looks like it's over 50%, you want to move the animals. So it's all observational has been my experience in talking with more holistic management folks, because I don't actively manage uh, cattle right now, um, but have managed horses is once you're down to six inches on your desirables, not your undesirable. So all, all animal, pardon me, all plant matter on a, a pasture is usually identified. Um, and then you observe the the graze the grazing animals regardless of what they are um in terms of what they go to first that's the ice cream in the refrigerator if you will so if anybody knows if they've spent lots of time inside or they've been sick and you keep opening up the fridge it's like you go for the ice cream and the cheese first and then you're all the way down to the lettuces and the broccoli um so animals are the similar they'll go for what they love first and then they'll come down 
So generally what you want to do is observe them, observe for what they're going for, and then monitor that specific species. When that's down to six inches from ground, what you're trying to do is protect the crown. Again, the crown in any plant is where we go from vegetative matter to root matter. And the crown is normally the brain of the plant. It's where if the plant is being eaten above, an auxin, A-U-X-I-N, will be sent, which is a hormone, will be sent from that eaten tip down to the crown going, we're dying, produce more vegetation. This is what happens with pruning. This is what happens with grazing. So when we prune, it's like we're being graziers, but with sharp shears, and we're pruning out and we send that information down to the crown and the crown comes back up. The other issue I'm trying to point out here is that if we're not respecting the crown, either by allowing animals to eat into it, or if we ever inundate the crown with either mulch, so we mulch too close to the stem of a plant that's then being, um, that, that then is then moving from vegetative matter to root matter, you enter into vectors for disease. So this is why we don't mulch directly up against a stem. We pull back a couple of inches or, you know, 10 centimeters or thereabouts. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the other thing is we never want to design either our basin swales, net and pan swales also called, or swales themselves. So that way when the swales fill up, that the stems that are to be fed by that water could be inundated with water. That'll create uh, crown rot, which will be stem rot, and then you'll lose the plant. So we want to respect that crown. Same thing with, with grazing. We want to respect that crown because if that crown gets eaten into, that crown will die out. So um, Janet, looks like you just came on. We're just getting to the uh, the end of my explanation of your your question. So definitely come back and, and listen again, but uh, basically observe your animals as they come into your new pasture. This is a pasture that's been left to rest and the grass is high. Um, observe the plants that they're going for first. And then when those plants are down to six inches or what Joel Salton calls boot height, that's when you want to move them to the next pasture. That gives the that site a lot of regeneration time. Great question. Louisa, I was curious about how our course modules map onto working with clients in a professional setting. <laughs> uh, I love that. Uh, do you find that in practice, all the steps are needed for thoughtful design or workflow to become more specific or summarized over time as you gain experience with site and applying the principles? In other words, when working with clients, do you find yourself working through the steps we do in class? Great question. Now we're getting into the nitty gritty of how does becoming a regenerative land designer uh, compare with learning a simple tool. So I just started a new class today, just had this conversation with the students this morning. And again, I'll just repeat, because we've, we've talked about this before, but permaculture for me is a tool in my toolbox. And I use it within the larger spectrum of regenerative land design. The reason why I've chosen those words is because it's the largest, it's the largest spectrum I can use without feeling like I'm becoming an, an ardent opponent of any one of the tools I use. I don't want to deify the screwdriver or the hammer. I want to keep my mind open, not so open that it falls out, but I want to be conscientious. So I use the Living Soil Food Web. I use uh, Christine Jones's approach to soil. I use Elaine uh, Ingham's approach to soil. I use uh, Paul Stamets' approach to mycology, as well as Peter McCoy's approach. I use all of these different tools within what I do. My client process is I have a good fit call and I and I get the sense of if I'm a good fit for them and they're a good fit for me. This will be specific to all of you. For me, I want to know that these are individuals that want to work with the ecology and not against it. So generally, if they're starting to talk about um, pesticides, insecticides, removing all the soil of the landscape, they're probably not a good fit, fit for me. And I tell them that right up front. I said, if you want to work more ecolo ecologically, we can work together. But if you're just uh, raping and pillaging a piece of landscape, I'm not interested. It's not what I do. Um, then we go through those questions. And I don't know if we've talked about good fit calls, but um, I'm happy to. So years ago, I came across a process called a good fit call. And a good fit call replaces a sales call. I'm not selling my services. I'm not. I'm not interested in selling my services. I'm interested in seeing if they're a good fit for me and if I'm a good fit for them. I'm evaluating both things. And the email you get from me when you send me a hey, I want to work together, be it in life design or land design, is we're going to do a good fit call. You have to answer these questions and we're going to have a 20 to 45 minute call depending on how much we talk. When they get that survey, the survey goes like this. Explain to me the situation you're in. Why are you coming to me? What brought you to me? 
what brought you to me specifically? So why me? That gives a reputation. That's really important to track how people are getting to you. So you know what kind of reputation building efforts to put out to the world. And then we get to the meat of it. What's the problem you're trying to solve? If somebody's trying to solve a problem that doesn't require a lot of analysis, great. I don't have to go deep into the analysis. It's sometimes a simple conversation. If somebody's trying to solve a problem like, what do I do with my watershed? That is a full design conversation. I made that mistake before where I just did the water and then I was like, oh, it affects everything. This was years ago when I was um, young and, and a bit more, um, I had more gumption than brains, I would say. Um, but we need to get that sense. So what's the problem we're solving? And this is one of the first things <clears throat> that you can do as a designer to help your clients for free is help them clarify. And some of the clients I haven't worked with for whatever reason said that they got so much out of the good fit call because I helped them clarify what they were looking for. And many times it wasn't me, which is great because I don't have to suffer through a client that's not a good fit. Second is what's the obstacle to solving that problem thus far? Sometimes it's information, sometimes it's knowledge, sometimes it's labor, sometimes it's money. Uh, sometimes it's, we don't have a plan. Um, those, are, those are the common land design ones. Uh, and sometimes it's specific. Sometimes it's we have a matriarch in the family who runs the farm the way their dad did and their dad died in 1920 and the matriarch is still running the farm. And, and those are problems I can't solve. So that's important as well. When you're stepping into design, especially with families, you have to know that there's some problems you can't solve. You can solve land problems, but unless you're a counselor, you're not solving those problems. Um, problem, obstacle, what's the cost of the problem? <laughs> if the cost of the problem isn't high enough, they may not be a good fit for you because they're not interested in your services because your fees don't equal uh, the the pain that they're feeling. So it's just important to know if if they've started to get, see what the cost is of not solving this problem. And a lot of it's missed opportunity. You get a lot of people saying we have missed opportunity or we, we find we're, we're, we're spinning our gears and we can't figure it out. So it's important about that. And then ideal outcome. What is the ideal outcome you want to have? So is the ideal outcome a beautiful, stunning property that is uh, self-sufficient in water and, and most of its, its food in the next five to 10 years? What is it? From all of that, then I get a sense of, are they good fit? I tell them generally what my services are. And then usually within a day to a week, I don't like hearing the during the call. I'm I'm so anti high pressure sales. <laughs> There's so many times people are like, I want to work with you. I'm like, great, sleep on it. And if in the morning, that's the case, let's do it. Because <laughs> people get excited in the moment. Um, once we start working together, I will see if there is any high grade topographical information that is pre-accessible that I, that I don't have to pay for, they don't have to pay for, if we do have to pay for it, it's pre-existing. I want high grade information, 10 centimeters or less of accuracy. Again, Google Earth data isn't good enough. That was from the LIDAR mission uh, back in 2000, the shuttle radar topographic mission, the SRTM mission, it's not good enough. Um, and, and most of the contour map generators online, even the ones you pay for, are based upon that garbage information. So don't pay for garbage. Um, if we can't get it, then I either survey the site or we uh, hire a survey. So we get high grade topographical information. And the ways we survey is for me, I could do a drone flyover if there's not too much uh, cover. And if there isn't, I have to rent what's called an RTK ground station along with a surveying uh, point post that goes around and we take, we take points. From there, I do an in-depth assay, also a remote summary of all of the um, uh, scale of permanence items. So we start at climate, and we go topography, and we go water, access, ecosystems, all the way down. So I want to know everything about that site. Uh, geography includes what are the regulations. So if I can't do the survey myself, uh, myself, I will hire an urban planner, and they will do a survey of the local regulations for the client wants. So at this point, I've got the client wants, the clients are looking at it, and I'm comparing the two. At that point, I start working on a concept design, and I primarily use Google Earth Pro plus Morfolio Trace. So Google Earth Pro allows me to put all that georeference data into the material, I put it in. As we start to compare and contrast the template, I do a survey, I do an interview of them, I get a sense of what they want. I will make a base map, usually on Google Earth Pro. 
I will then develop usually a sector map and a microclimate map with them because they know the site better than I do. And if we don't, we start interviewing people around them to understand what are the flows, what's going on. That gives us the information we need. Um, microclimate is dependent upon my availability and their desire to pay for a site visit. So my design fees used to, but don't anymore include site visits. Site visits are extra. And site visits can be half a day, three hours, eight hours. I just did one. It was, I think, three and a half hours long. Uh, flew the drone, did a vegetative assay, got a sense of what was on the site. Um, had to had to challenge the idea that water runs uphill. It's fun. <laughs> well, the water comes this way. No, it doesn't. <laughs> this is lower than that. <laughs> water comes this way, not that way. Um, and then soil samples, I tend to take, um, I tend to do lab soil analysis uh, and I'll do a hand site. So I'll, I'll usually do a ribbon test. This is one of the reasons why I introduced the ribbon test into OSU because the ribbon test, you should learn how to do over and over again. I would suggest during the seasons that it's not cold and frozen, do four or five uh, in, in, a, in a month, just really get a feel for it. It's a really good tool to have. And then I'll do what's called a, a visual assay. Uh, we don't do it in this program, but I've been I've been advocating for it for a long time. Basically, you do a transect, uh, which is a square. Pardon me, a quadrat. A transect is a, a line. You do a quadrat and you do a, a, a visual account. How many insects can we see? How much of that area is covered and uncovered? And all of this gives us information about what does it look like? So what does the soil ecology look like? Then I'll send away a sample usually to A and L laboratories, A and L laboratories, and I will get a full mineral assay, a pH, which can or cannot be useful. I can talk about that. Um, I will get a fungal to bacterial ratio, which they can now do usually quite easily and cheaply. And if there is any contamination issues, I will get con uh, sp uh contaminant specific because you have to pay for each contaminant you test for so like if you're testing for arsenic versus boron uh, or versus radium you have to specifically pay for that these what are all you, extra i'm Go sorry to interrupt what if you don't know that something could be in there it could it, like what if you don't suspect a particular contaminant you could just miss it then right yeah you didn't know to look for it okay same same thing as healthcare right like how many people go undiagnosed because we don't have a general scan that'll take everything. So usually what I'm doing is I'm asking questions of the neighbors. What generally has has the industry been around here? Who's doing what in terms of farming? Are people spraying or overspraying pesticides or insecticides? If there is <laughs> if there is an issue, I'll probably I'll, I'll usually do glyphosate and usually broadleaf um, herbicides is usually what I'll do just to get a sense of it. Um, if there's any indication of a dumping zone, and if that dumping zone is directly above a waterway, I'll usually do a full heavy metal test somewhere along the drainage, usually at the bottom, because water flows downhill, and I'll do a water test. So sometimes I'll do a water test as well if there's contamination. It's kind of a different protocol with water. Um, vegetative assay. So we talked about that. Uh, this is usually why I want to know the climax ecology before I get on site. So I can basically do a bingo. Like, <laughs> did I see this animal? Did I see this animal? Nope, no, none of these, none of these, none of these, but I am seeing them here. Okay, then that starts to generate the like, why? Why am I seeing them only here? And so that's a bit of the processing that takes time to learn. Um, then I'm taking a look at ground cover. Uh, and then I'm taking a look at animal and scat and seeing if the animals that should be there, if there's signs of. This is a whole other skill. Um, I took a couple of tracking courses to start to identify scat and just understand which animals are which. But like I talked about with uh, plant ID, there's also scat ID uh, groups on Reddit and social media. So it's a great place to go, whose poop is this? And um, just understand sometimes what they're eating because that can also be an indication. I just I just came back from the Galapagos Islands and uh, the land tortoises, which are wild, um, they squeeze their food. And so a lot of their material that they eat ends up coming through their feces. So you can you can tell exactly what they're eating. So that's important as well. And if you're working with grazing animals like cows, it's important to be able to identify material in scat as well. OK, where are we now? Uh, cross sections. So I'll usually do two or three cross sections of a site. Um, because I want to understand what is the 
What is the drop? And it's usually to help the client understand what their site looks like. So I tend to do that, or I tend to take the high grade um, elevational data. And with the help of a GIS specialist, I will drape a high resolution ortho photograph over that, that topographic information. So that way they can see their site and they move through it. I realized I should start doing this a couple of years ago when I was working with a client who was a early adopter of virtual reality because they were a pro gamer. They played video games professionally. And uh, they're like, I want to see my land through Google Earth. And so we flew through virtual reality to see their site. And he got it like immediately. And I was like, oh, that's a cool tool. I should start using that. So started to develop that as a tool. Um, so now we're at uh, soil, which we talked about. So I'll do assessment of any sort of uh, soil materials in the area or the materials that they personally have or have access to. So that's the same. Uh, local ecology is the same. All the ecology is exactly the same. I do a high, I do a high definition scan of, of ecology. Uh, and then we get into design. And so at the end of my first round with folks, I get to a conceptual design, generally what should go where. This is the end of what I call the feasibility study. And it's a feasibility study because they're asking me, I want this. And I'm telling them, is it feasible? I used to have people say, I want this. And I would break my back trying to figure out a way to make it happen. And I realized that was dumb. <laughs> not all requests are viable. <laughs> and sometimes people want um, an economic essay. They want an enterprise essay. Could we do this enterprise on this site? And that's super fun as well to get into, which is a whole other specific skill set. Uh, we get to the end of the concept and they get a full feasibility study, which people have called the manual to like the car manual to my site because I go into how your site works. And then there's all of my GIS overlays. So we've got aspect slope, degree slope, degree percentage, uh, solar solar wattage per meter squared, because sometimes you want to put more sun-loving plants in a certain area. So that gives us that. Um, total water indicator, total water wetness, and then capture. So they get all of that plus the concept. And right now I'm doing concepts via Google Earth Pro. If they walk if they want to spend the time to either get it rendered by somebody so you can generally see what it would look like or if they want to spend money on me to render it with uh, Morfolio Trace, that's fine. But I don't offer that as a base model. From there, then we go into detailed design because at that point, I usually know how much a detailed design will cost. And depending on what they want, we'll go all the way down to landscape design details so that way they can hand it off to a landscape designer. What I'm doing more now of is because I, I usually do solo solo design and then I'll do management of a crew is I know a number of crews in my area that I can hand projects off to and they can go and they can install it. And this is great for the client because the client doesn't have to pay for a, a high resolution design, which is usually takes the majority of the budget. Uh, they can have a rough design and the people I work with know installation so well that they know sizing and scaling and layout. But when you're starting, you have to learn all of that. So how do I, how did I answer your question? Um, I would say I do everything within the assignments besides the personal survey, uh, the land acknowledgement, and everything else is done, but it's usually done in a different format. It's usually done through Google Earth Pro. Great question. Questions? No question. Just um, I was in my head of being like, okay, so how do I download all those competencies? But I guess it'll just take time. <laughs> um, and also, I'm tired. That sounds like yeah. a lot. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. And, and this will also speak to what you take on. That is for large landscape. That's for like, an acre and more, right? Yeah. So if we're doing a farm or homestead, that's the process. And I am a fastidious individual. I like that level of fastidious nature. There's lots of my colleagues that will give a rough plan and that's what they do. Or they'll give a detailed plan and that's what they do. So part of it is getting a sense of what is it that you want to offer and how much, how, how confident are you in your design? Totally. No, I think it's really exciting when you are, 
when you, when you're more like, if it's like a, if I'm language analogy, when you're a little bit more proficient in all the languages, you know, it's almost like, do you want to do this like Shakespearean play when like you're barely learning? You know what I'm saying? Like, it's kind of like, that's how it feels like. It's like, sounds, you know, great. And you know, you need to like build the basics first or something, but that's cool. Thank you for that. That's yeah. quite the journey. <laughs> no worries. And when I started, I would do a sector analysis because permaculture was the only tool in my toolbox. So I would do a sector analysis. I would do a microclimate analysis. I would do a zones analysis. And then I would start to, to design. That's all I would do. And sometimes the client got to see those, those tools of assessment for me. Sometimes they didn't. Sometimes it was like, I just want to see the design and I just want help in like what to do. Phasing plans became a really big deal early on. People really want, like, what do I do next? They want help with the prioritization and the sequencing of something. Mm -hmm. And that's where the scale of permanence is so useful because you should start at the top and move down. We can't change the climate any more than we already are. Move down to geography. So uh, what are we changing in terms of hardscaping, earthscaping? Then we move down to water because it's dependent on earthscaping. Then we move down to access because if you can't access it, you can't work with it. Then finally, we move down to ecology, right? Ecological systems. So even there, I was just talking with the class this morning that just started and long, thoughtful, protracted thought, you know, observation, pardon me, long, thoughtful, protracted observation. That's what sets permaculture away from everything else. I've, I've worked with architects who have a design within four days. I'm like, how is that possible? You don't even know where it is. And a lot of the times it'll be like, it doesn't matter. Technology takes care of it. It's like, yeah, that's why we are where we are. Because <laughs> nothing's contextually based. It's just like, it works. Let's just stamp something with a, a building. Because I worked in natural building originally, and because I worked in conventional construction before that, I'm so aware of bad design when it comes to buildings. The building is not contextually based within its surroundings, right? So many people are like, I want the hemp house or I want the cob house. Well, once you get into the prairies, once you get into that orthographic effect where it's really cold and really hot, Cobb is a terrible choice. Cobb's a battery that absorbs heat and lets it back out. And when you're minus 30 for three months on end, the battery's empty. So moving to insulation, moving to something like straw bale or light straw or light clay straw, where you create a form and you pack it in, makes more sense. So it's always about being contextually based. So what I would say is if you're starting off, start with a backyard, start with a front yard, work out the water first, help them move the water away from the house, help them sink it into the ground, Make sure that there's an overflow that can go to the pre-existing system within the, the city or the environment. Um, and then choose really good plants. You know, choose the hits. Choose the ones that always work. Don't go out of zone. Don't suffer from out of zone zoninitis. You know, nine out of ten socialists suffer from it. It's like, oh, I can make a peach work. Yeah, you can, but it takes a lot of work and effort. Why don't we just work yeah. on the hits? So. Right. Beatles, you know, only classics. Only Got the it. classics. <laughs> only the hits. And I'm, I got yeah. that but I was going to say, I was going to start with like, um, my own yard. So like, yeah. I can only disappoint myself or be happy with myself. That's very low stakes. And then I was going to do volunteer yeah. projects, which also free labor. What are you going to do? Like ask for a refund? You know what I'm saying? 100%. I can get 100%. practice. And then, um, I was going to say, it made me think about that video about the, on the watershed, how they talked about how the States would be divided if it was based mm -hmm. on watersheds with that comment you made about, technology the mentality of it you know like that's something that I've thought about like quite a bit and um anyways I'm just processing out loud but yeah yeah okay yeah anyways please. that's and it that, that that's a great way to do it and and take before and afters of your projects so take before shots after shots and the great thing is you get to showcase what you're doing so if if it is an urban lot signage at the front this is a a, a, a landscape designed with permaculture permaculture is x we work to meet the needs of the surrounding ecology and provide for those inside it. Like let people know. And usually we will do a snack track. Snack tracks are kind of the it thing when it comes to urban design, which is you feed the the pedestrian path passengers, right? The, the traffic, not the pedestrian, pedestrians. You feed them. So basically you have like high berries, low berries, and then you have little signs of what's what's ripe and when. This is edible. Eat this now. Because so much of when you're growing up as a kid in urban landscapes is don't touch the berries because <laughs> mostly they're poisonous ornamentals, which is hilarious. Um, but yeah, and then volunteer. Absolutely. And then the big thing is, is if you are going to go out there, choose clients that 
if you're willing to work for free, they're willing to put up the money to put the design in the ground so you can get reputation building materials. Like, here's what I've done before. Here's what I've done after. Here's what it looks like. That's the most important thing. Yeah, vol. Uh, Amarins, how much time do you invest in a project before actually getting to the design part? Um, so feasibility studies are rated anywhere from three to six months, sometimes nine, depending on how far away they are. Um, each section is dependent upon the response time I have from the client. I don't like doing more than one project at a time. I learned years ago when I was doing 37 projects at one time and learned that I had lost my mind and I had lost my sense of enjoyment. So, um, and then I just kind of came down, came down. I was like, well, I could do like two project at pre-design and design. I was like, no, I just like working on one. I like working on one and doing it really well and then working on other projects. So that's that's the important thing for me. But again, the way I run my design business should not be the way that you run yours. You should you should follow Bruce Lee's advice. Take the best, leave the rest and add something uniquely your own. If you want to do a design business, how does it look like for you? Who do you want to work with? What's your clientele like? One of the things that I do, uh, which I really appreciate from Gordon and Baird, B-A-I-R-D, at eco-sense.ca. Gordon is a major influence in my work. Uh, he's taught two courses with regenerative living, a composting toilets course, and the best rainwater harvesting course I have been a part of and that I have seen online. And I'm so grateful to have been able to supply that as a resource. So many of these design um, rainwater design courses are run by people who don't install and it's a problem like you want people who are installing rainwater designs or installing composting toilets to teach you how to design them um, but the big thing about them is they live a three-third life they live a third of their life for um, uh, for income a third of their life for themselves and a third of their life for their community so there's a third of what they put out there which is for others and so I've been working with a couple of indigenous um, tribes, helping them create uh, sustenance gardens for their elderly and for themselves. And once you get to that place, it's really nice to do a little bit of volunteer work and just give back to whatever system. Um, I'm setting my, my sights on the Galapagos. It's fascinating how water scarce they are and how dependent they are on the ships and how COVID affected them so dramatically. And how the community came together, like the first three months were okay, but as the ship stopped coming, the ranchers in the highlands would bring down beef and they would go around to everybody's homes and give everybody some beef and the fishermen would come up and once a week everyone would get a fish. And there was an amazing community conversation that happened. It was almost energy descent in a in microcosm. And we've seen this a few times. We've seen it in Cuba during the special period in the 90s. Uh, we've seen it in a lot of different areas. And so... Yeah, that's that's my new musing. I'm not committing to anything, but uh, uh, I think it'll be very interesting to do some work out there. And I don't know, maybe an in-person PDC, a long PDC like I used to run with Cuba in, in the Galapagos would be fun. We used to do these Cuban PDCs that were 21 days and you would learn and you would visit all these amazing farmers and cultural sites and, and nature sites as well. And then the last 10 days you would design and install. Now the instructors kind of had a, a sense of what was going on first, but everybody went through the design process and we kind of crafted and helped people. And then you designed for a few days and then you installed, you just went right into it and you were digging swales and putting in, um, putting in plants and, and showing people how to do low tech um, compost tea, which is sopa de caca in Spanish, which mm. I love. <laughs> um, but yeah. Can you repeat the name of the water design person? The rainwater harvesting design was Gord Baird. Gord Baird. And uh, I will, we're generative living. This is my first day back. I haven't touched a computer in 10 days. It's taking me a moment to remember what the heck I'm supposed to do on this thing. Uh, let me just find the rainwater harvesting masterclass. Interesting. It's not here right now. Um, that's very curious. That should not be the case. Maybe it's not listed on the front page. Oh, what sort of management? Interesting. Oh, I know why. Yeah, it's just been converted to the self-paced course. So Amarin's, uh, if you want, uh, and if you're not on my mailing list yet, allpointsdesign.ca, bottom of the page, sign up for the newsletter. We'll be launching the self-paced course 
this week, next week, something like that. Gord uh, is one of the busiest rainwater harvesting specialists I know. He also does water treatment. So that's also part of the course, how to treat water um, to a potable grade. Um, he works on small and large scale community water systems, including residentials as well. So it's a good uh, resource for folks. Um, let's go by it and see. How much time do you invest? We said that six nine. Can you repeat? Yeah, both of those are in. Cool. What else? <laughs> we got fifteen minutes. Any other questions, can Janet? You, yeah, go for it. Yeah, can you mention a little bit more about the? Um, you said you were into natural building. Like, what were the different things that you looked into? I'm kind of interested in earth bag building, and I mm -hmm. wanted to maybe do a um, like a not a, not a seller, a root, a root seller kind of deal. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah. Anyway, I'm just curious what you can share yeah. about that. Yeah, for sure. Um, well, natural building is an incredible skill to have in your arsenal, it, be it in a project specific way. Like, you know, how to build cob ovens. So you know how to have, you know, outdoor, uh, outdoor cooking appliances or be it wood material. So, you know how to work with pole wood, let's say, or timber frame. So all of these have really great and amazing uh, applications for, for our work. When we come to structured design, and specifically when we come to root cellar design, there's a lot of really great ways to go about it. Generally, earthen uh, root cellars have the best thermal insulation and the best U value to basically moderate temperature during the summer and during the winter, because you don't want a root cellar to freeze and you don't want a root cellar to get hot. Uh, the best root cellar design I've seen thus far comes out of Sepholzer's work, and he details that in Sepholzer Permaculture. And then Zach Weiss of, uh, of Elemental Ecosystems does an amazing job of explaining that conversation. And generally what we're doing is you're creating large timbers in a pit that has a sloping mm -hmm. uh, floor that goes away from the the back of the root cellar. So if the condensation does build up, it moves out the front door. Um, and then you're creating a structure that's basically post and beam and post and beam and post and beam. And then you're you're giving it um, usually waterproofing on the top and the sides. But when I was at uh, the Krematerhof, which is Sepp's original farm, he now lives at the Holzerhof, which is in the south side of Austria. Uh, one of the higher root cellars that didn't have as much earthen material around it he diverted a little stream just a little like time that came off and dripped down the back to cool the entire area and give it some moisture because he was working with a material that he didn't want to totally dry out um yeah i, I would say i would follow quite a quite a mm -hmm. quite a few of those conversations because they're just they're brilliant and he does such a good job at that that piece earth bag you can use and you can either do what's called continuous or single earth bag so single earth bag is you take a single bag of earth usually mixing somewhere between two to ten percent of concrete in with the earth so that way it doesn't shift and usually when you're laying it down you're laying down um uh strips of rebar or not rebar, barbed wire so that way they don't shift so that way they stack on one another um as we get into materials, it's really important to understand two aspects, insulation value and U value, the ability to resist heat from moving through the material and the ability for the material to absorb heat. So earth has a great ability to absorb heat and hold heat. Its insulative value is not as good as something that has a lot of airspace. Airspace creates insulative value. So straw bales, lots of airspace. Um, fiberglass material, uh, fiberglass uh, insulation, lots of airspace, uh, rock spun rock material, like rock salt, lots of airspace. Mm -hmm. So with earth bag materials, you can use it to create the structure if you want, and then do the material around it. But it always comes back down to what do you have locally? And this is where I take one of the firm stands I have, which is if you're not being specific to the materials around you, and if you're import importing hemp, like I worked with somebody who imported hemp from the prairies onto the West coast. And I was like, what are you doing? Like this material is not local. It has no business being out here, but you're a natural builder. It's like, we have wood chips. We have some straw here. Let's do light clay straw, which is the same thing they were doing with hemp herd, which is the, the seed casing that comes off of hemp. And they were mixing it with a clay slurry. They were forming up their walls, just like you would with concrete. And they were packing it in um, to create this uh, hygroscopic 
material. And I say hygroscopic because a lot of people talk about a breathable wall. Walls don't breathe. They don't have lungs. <laughs> they can absorb moisture and they can let moisture out. And depending on the material, specifically the clay usually, that's how they absorb that moisture. Gordon Ann built one of the most beautiful homes I've ever seen. It was a two-story cob load-bearing building. Cob is a homogenous mixture of clay, uh, clay, sand, or stone, and chopped straw. And they built it in such a way that it was seismically, uh, seismically resistant. Mm -hmm. And they're science geeks. So uh, through a partnership, I think with the University of Victoria, or it could have been University of British Columbia, they put in moisture meters. And when they won a big uh, building challenge called the Living Building Challenge, which is uh, leads gone the right way. Leeds is okay, the lead building standard, but the living building standard is incredible. And if you're interested in building, highly recommend you check it out. But uh, they had a big, a big celebratory party. I think they had 20 or 30 people in the house. And they were able to measure how much moisture everyone gave off and how much the walls absorbed. And then after they left, that that wonderful graft of all that moisture being released back into the home and then being let out through windows and doors and whatnot. So I think when you're starting to talk about materials, it's important to know what's local. What can you pull from the site or from the area? If you have lots of timbers, I'm always keen on moving that way. Um, if you're thinking about earth bags for the, for the wall materials, that's totally fine. You just have to make sure that you really work on that, uh, that, uh, that inter bag. There's a word for it. I'm forgetting it. It's, it's, it's what keeps the bags from shifting. It's not sheer, but something else. Um, and then from there, how are you going to finish them? Because earth bags look ugly, in my opinion. Again, my opinion. But I think white nylon bags staring me in the face when I'm going to get potatoes, I'm, I'm not interested. So it's really about like, how do you finish that? And so it's hard to stick clay materials to earth bags. It's not impossible, but you can. So a lot of people do concrete plasters, which is okay. But again, what do you want to be surrounded by? Like, what do you want to make it look like? So um, totally doable. You'd still have to use another material for the roof. Um, and you'd still have to do some kind of, of, of water, water treatment on the sides, but, uh, yeah, it's doable. And then the continuous bags are really cool if you're doing circular design. So continuous bags are basically just mm -hmm. that it's a big, long tube. You fill it up and you keep working with that material and it's very stable seismically because it's always got that homogenous feel to it, but it's not cob. Um, so lots of good reasons to use that. I have uh, in the master resource list on the office hours q and I've got a huge section of building books because I went into natural building first and there's some great dome building books in there to check out, which I would I would look at, or earth bag books. Great question. Awesome, thank you. Um, can you mention Seth's last name again that you mentioned in the beginning? Sepp Holzer, S-E-P-P. H O S E L Z E R. And he has a series of book uh, books. Uh, the first one is Sepulcher Permaculture, which is kind of, for me, for folks that are wanting to do this work, it's mandatory reading because you get a sense of somebody who was doing this long before he found out the word and he adopted the word after the fact. Uh, his other book, uh, Desert to Paradise, about his project in Portugal, is exceptional. And then the book I personally love is Rebel Farmer. Uh, and it's all about how he was doing farming so differently in Austria, which is a very homogenous society. Um, almost all those European cultures have a, a saying, like the Japanese is uh, the tall nail gets hammered down in the Netherlands. It's the tall tulip gets snipped. And I think it's the same, same one in Austria. Um, but they came with a psychiatric wagon to take them take him away to the asylum because they thought he was crazy for growing fruit trees and doing ponds and all of those things. And he hid in his land. He's like, you're never going to find me. Um, but he had, a, they had a straight jacket for him. Uh, it's a really fun read. It's, it's similar to Joel Salatin's everything I want to do is a legal book, right? When you get those sort of personal essays or memoirs, <laughs> uh, it's pretty good. So yeah, great That's books. Awesome. And then am I understanding you, am I understanding correctly that you said earth bag is better to like reduce heat like it's going to keep the heat out of your structure but it's not so good for insulation so if you're living in a cold climate that might not be the best yeah option. so basically u value if it has a high u value it absorbs and transfers heat very well but it also absorbs and transfers cool c-o-o-l-t-h 
L-T-H, Kulf. So um, this doesn't really exist in physics, but we use it as a, as a concept to talk about because what happens is materials give off their heat and then they drop their heat, which then leaves them at a, a lower state of entropy, basically, and they're cooler. So basically, if you've got like a brick building or a concrete, this is a cinder block building, it has a, a relatively high U value, um, less than brick, which is solid, right? That's a higher U value. And so it can absorb heat and it can give it out during the night. And that's why cob and earth bag and brick are good for climates that give that are cotton cold. In, in the daytimes. And this is why we see earth bags being used a lot in um, arid climates, hot climates, tropical climates as well. Once we get into places that get very cold for a long series of time, generally we want some kind of insulative value. And uh, I, I can't remember the numbers. I, I don't remember them offhand, but I'm pretty sure wood has a higher insulative value than earth bags do, depending on what their sizing is. But they all have certain U, U and R values per inch. And that would be what I would look at when I was, if I, if I were designing a root cellar. So what kind of material would you recommend for um, uh, an environment where you're like, last year we had negative 50 temperatures here. And where are you going? So probably not earth bag in Wyoming. Wyoming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I probably go with, with a wood structure. I'd probably go with um, a wood structure that's offset. So you have offset beams that act as your insulation and then really focus on probably a rigid rigid foam core door that then insulates. Because of course the door is the, the, the thinnest element of your structure as opposed to the, the walls. And so you'd want it to fit quite tight. Um, you could do earthen bag if you wanted to create a bit of a buffer around it, but um, I probably do wood. Um, it's about the same situation as you're looking in Austria or up where I was living in Alberta. Thank you. Yeah, you're most welcome. All right. Any other questions? Look at this. We had no questions and we spent a whole hour. Awesome. <laughs> How's everybody feeling about the course? Overwhelmed? Like they took on too much, but they're loving it at the same time? I think it's been great. Um, definitely the last assignment, um, I'm glad we had the extra bit of time for it because it took me a lot longer to deal with my soil than I thought it would. Um, I did have an unusual thing with my percolation test for one of my holes. And I ran the test three times because I was so convinced something was going wrong. But um, it never drained at a consistent rate. Like it drained faster at the start and then would slow down. And it did the same thing all three times. Right. So I assume right. that's just what it does, but I have no idea why. <laughs> yeah. So fast percolation at the start and then um, slower towards the end means that when your soil gets to what's called field capacity, think about microscopically, you have these soil peds, these molecules of soil. And so they're clay, sand, and silt. And basically there's a water lens around each of these little molecules, these little soil mm -hmm. peds. And then there's still terrestrial airspace. Um, with sand, there's better infiltration and better drainage. With clay, there's poor infiltration and much poorer drainage. So mm -hmm. usually when we get high infiltration at the beginning and then it starts to peter out, that means that soil moves from dry to field capacity. And then when those interstitial airspaces get filled with water, then we move into saturation. So that means that that soil starts at a good infiltration and gets to saturation uh, relatively quickly and then slows up it just means that it probably is kind of central to um central to a clay or it's stratified in that the first section is quite porous and then it hits an uh, yeah. uh, a poor draining soil yeah it oddly enough that section of my yard has the least amount of clay of all the samples i took which is oh, what interesting. was interesting about it <laughs> yeah. yeah well and the other thing is is that that could be below your test pit. yeah it's possible that's true i yeah, I have no idea what's below where I dug, you know? <laughs> yeah. Did you took a look at the NRCS data for your site? I'm guessing. Yeah, it's states. mostly um, a high amount of uh, fine sandy loam, like sandy very loam. high amount of, fi high, of very fine sand. Okay. Um, and are you an urban area? Uh, somewhat. 
Um, I'm in a, more of a suburban area, I guess I would say. Um, okay. But I'm relatively close to some urban areas, so. So technically, you're probably in what's called the urban mosaic, which is uh, lots of materials moved around when they're mm -hmm. developing a, a suburb. Um, and it stratifies. So basically they're like, hey, I need a bit more material from over here and they bring it in and they layer it in. So mm -hmm. uh, urban soil tests are a mixed bag at best because you never know what's underneath until you actually do a full, like full excavator arms width test, which you'll never do because it makes no sense. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I agree with Louisa. I love your cat. <laughs> yeah, he's he wants to play. So he's, he's like, been... stop talking to people in your magic scream i'm here now <laughs> that's great that's that's a good conversation but think about it from a first principles perspective whenever that happens it's infiltration is quick it gets to saturation quickly and what's important about that is when you when you're starting to think about uh, watering cycles be conscientious about when that water moves to a slower percolation rate mm -hmm. and then measure the amount of water that comes out of your hose in terms of seconds or minutes and then you actually have a really good gauge on how much water to give your soil. Because mm -hmm. the rest of that is, is just putting your soil into saturation. And again, our plants are terrestrial. The organisms that support them are terrestrial. If it moves to saturation, you'll see a die off. If it was a chart, you would see a yep. die off of soil microbes. So yeah, that's great. Yeah, it's, it's odd because like the other two holes I dug, it, they drained at very consistent rates. And it was just that last one that I tested. And I was like, I don't know what's happening here. <laughs> Yeah, if if it mattered, I'd probably then go like five or ten feet out on a on a triangle, and so like do do triangles on like a what is that a sex hexagon hexagon, um, yeah. and then kind of get a sense of if that's a localized effect or not. But that's yeah. if you're feeling particularly nerdy, which you may just want to put plants in the ground and let them tell you. <laughs> awesome. Thanks so much. Anybody else want to pipe in how they're doing with the class or any conversations that we need to address? No, I, I, I'm really enjoying it. Um, I, I do feel overwhelmed at times for me, it was the water one that felt like it took a long time. I don't know why my, and my head took just some minutes, like absorb it. And, um, I think, I don't know. I, I have a, a little one at home and I figured like, I'm not going to get less busy. So I might as well do my best to, you know, get what I can and do my best. And so I, I feel like I'm okay with it not being perfect. Um, I'm, I'm really enjoying it. I just know that like, I have like so much to learn afterwards too, you know? So that's kind of how I'm, I guess, sitting with it, knowing that there's just so much more that will maybe be part of it over time in practice. Yeah. Well said. Well said. Yeah. I was going to say something after you 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 were, were talking about um, the skills that are necessary afterwards. One of the things that I've started to do a lot more of is when clients or sorry, my students are done with the class um, and other classes I've been in is they come and they want to be mentored. And what we'll do is we'll create what's called a DACUM chart, D-A-C-U-M, developing a curriculum. And it's used in trade schools. And I came across it a decade ago and I started using it with clients to basically iterate out what are all the skills I need to understand? What's the soft skills, the hard skills, the technical skills. And then for what I want to do in the next six months, what's the skill that is the most important, but I have the least capacity on. So there's usually two columns in terms of um, capacity or, or capability, how capable am I in this and how important is this skill? And then using that to strategically go about kind of prioritizing kind of a hit list of skills that you need and then going and either doing more intensive formal or informal training, mentoring, volunteering with certain people that you could pick up those skills. The great thing about that is that if you come to a mentor, always show up with value. I'd like to come and weed your garden. What I want out of it is to learn these four things. And that's what did me so well when I started because I was a city, I was a city boy. I was raised in the city. I was in Boy Scouts. I I knew what I knew what plants were able to be lit on fire when I was camping. That was it. <laughs> that was that was my extent. So I had to learn all of the plant identification and all the soil science and the physics and all the rest of that. But it was really important for me after I finished to go, okay, what's my weakness? And how do I attack that as quickly as possible? Go like, how do I learn that? And then go to individuals, ideally locally, ideally locally who have that knowledge. And if not, you know, you can do it remotely. 
Like I've, I've got mentoring students from around the world and we just go through the process of that. And eventually soon, hopefully I'm going to start to offer um, a mentorship group with like 10 or 12 students after each class. And we're going to go through that process and that conversation. It's not going to be this year, <laughs> but um, hopefully within the next year or two. And that's why if you are keen, just get yourselves on that uh, mailing list newsletter for new courses and new offerings. Cause uh, eventually I want to have a, a high grade regenerative land design community that has all of these courses available. And um, we can address anybody's point specific issues that they're having and help them get into action sooner. Cause uh, everybody, everybody has their sense of what they think is going to be the next thing that's going to help save the world. But after 15 years of doing this, I've seen it happen. I've seen people live better lives and at the same time, take more responsibility for their, their food and their eating habits and their water. And it's incredible how quickly they have changed and uh, effectiveness. So for me, this is it. This is where I'm going to apply myself and do my work. So I'm, I'm excited to offer that in the, the upcoming conversations, but, um, and take some time. <laughs> I just want to make a suggestion for Please. people that might want to have a chance to like work on their skills is to look at your local community garden because there might be some volunteer work you can do there, even if it's just a small scale thing like our garden. We don't have any rainwater collection. It would be super easy to implement just one little rain barrel, you know, so I yeah. think that's an option. And then as far as the class, I feel like I've been way behind the whole time, but plugging along. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. It happens. Um, one thing to keep in mind, and this is really important because everyone, I say this at the beginning, we talk about it and then people forget about it, but there is a hard deadline for this class. Up until this point, it's like, I, I accept anything up to two weeks and after two weeks, um, you know, you may not get a full amount of feedback or any feedback. You may just get a, a mark. So all, all the assignments, everything is due on December 4th. So everything's due December 4th at 9 a.m. There is no extension because we have turnover of class. So even resubmissions, everything's due at that point. And again, your options are you can re-enroll. You can re-enroll in a future class. Uh, your options are you can just go through the class as is. Um, in 15 years, I've been asked for my PDC certificate once. And that's when I was applying to do a diploma with Permaculture Institute North America a month ago. So for you know 15 years and eight months, no one's asked me for it. So do you need it? I don't think you do. I think the knowledge is invaluable, but I don't think you need the certificate. So you may decide not to do it that way, or you may decide to re-enroll and, uh, and do it again. So there's there's options, but just know December 4th, 9 a.m., everything is due. Our passing, it's a B plus that we need to meet the competencies for the certificate, I think. I'll, I'll look at the curriculum, but yeah, or if to, you don't, to, yeah. To get your certificate, you need to do all assignments and you have to get 80% yeah. on all assignments and you have to do all of your peer reviews. So you have to do two okay. peer reviews per week not per assignment because sometimes there's three assignments but per week you have to do two comments on somebody else um and i think it's this not yours yeah it, this doesn't apply to you but basically we're increasing the requirements for the peer review um so you can't yeah. just say great assignment i'm glad i saw it but for you guys it's the same so it should be good any other questions okay well uh, i just want to add in um uh, uh, looking for volunteer work um you don't have to just look for like community gardens um I actually ran into a few weeks ago someone in um there's a lovely cemetery in the city that um I like to go for walks and I ran to a guy who started talking to me about um there's a restoration project they're doing there and so I've been helping out on the weekends with planting and things there and um this guy has like he has a degree in horticulture and a master's in landscape architecture so I've been running some ideas by him as well and and just helping plant this area, get some experience, hands-on experience with that. Amazing. Amazing. That's great. Uh, the funny thing about horticulture people, agriculture people, is that they're they're fans of the work that we do and they want to share. So generally they're very interested in sharing. That's awesome. Good for you, Sam. Well done. Okay, well, we'll see you again in two weeks. And uh, again, if you have any questions or comments and they can't wait, feel free to email me, javan at allpointsdesign.ca. 
if you're having a problem after going through all the tutorials and reading all the rubric and you're still having an issue, feel free to reach out. We can jump on Zoom and move through anything you need. And uh, yeah, uh, definitely during this later half, try to keep up as much as possible and maybe scale back the level of detail you're offering. A lot of people, once they get to the final designs, they're general, they're kind of concept designs. So uh, if you just want to get it done, you can definitely do that and uh, know you're going to take a hit on the points. But again, the points don't matter. The work matters. Sybil? All right. Lovely to see everybody. Uh, hopefully we'll see you again in two weeks. And if you have any questions, let me know. Adios.